Can you concisely define intermittent claudication? How is it investigated and how is it managed? In this tutorial, I'm going to give you the need to know tool of this important topic, starting with the history and differential diagnoses through to management and prognosis, including a visual guide on bypass graphs. So let's get started. First, I'm going to name some important blood vessels so you have a clue what I'm referring to in this tutorial. Starting with the abdominal aorta, it bifurcates at the level of L4 and umbilicus and becomes left and right common iliac arteries. These then divide into internal and external iliac arteries. The internal iliacs supply the buttocks and the pelvic organs and the external iliac arteries pass under the inguinal ligament becoming the common femoral artery or CFA for short. This quickly divides into the profunda femoris artery and the superficial femoral artery or SFA. The profunda femoris is an important collateral blood supply for the lower limb. Once the SFA passes through the adductor hiatus, it is called the popliteal artery and lives in the popliteal fossa behind the knee. It then trifurcates into anterior tibial artery, posterior tibial artery and perineal artery. The anterior tibial artery becomes the dorsalis pedis in the foot and the posterior tibial artery can be palpated midway between the medial malleolus and the tip of the calcaneum. When we talk about arterial disease of the lower limb, we're essentially talking about atherosclerosis in these vessels, leading to ischemia, claudication and tissue loss. When taking a history from someone suspected of having lower limb arterial disease, you need to ask questions that make the diagnosis, evaluates the severity and also the risk profile. Let's start with a typical history of intermittent claudication. Intermittent claudication is defined by four key parts. It is pain in a muscle group brought on by exercise and relieved by rest. So if your patient points to his or her calf muscle, they need to ask what brings on the pain and what relieves it to see if it fits the definition. Also ask about erectile dysfunction in males and also buttock claudication. Now these two symptoms may be present in aortoiliac disease, which is the Lariche syndrome. Now establish the severity. Get an idea of the claudication distance and whether or not this is stable or how quickly this is progressing. As part of the assessment of severity, ask whether or not there is rest pain. Very severe disease might see a patient dangle his or her legs out of bed at night in order to gain relief. Ask about tissue loss. Are there or have there been any ulcers in the lower limbs or feet? Finally, risk factors may be present. These are being a middle-aged man, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, raised cholesterol, known atherosclerotic disease, for example, patient may already have a diagnosis of angina, and a family history. You need to know these risk factors inside out, so it might be a good idea to pause this and then repeat it back. You need to ask the right questions during history taking to make sure you're not confusing peripheral arterial disease with other common pathologies that cause lower limb pain. The main causes of chronic lower limb pain are arterial insufficiency, which is why we're here, chronic venous insufficiency, neuropathy, so a problem with the nerves, in particular the ones coming out of the lumbosacral spine, and musculoskeletal pain, often due to osteoarthritis of the hip or knee. As ever, when you examine a patient, first wash your hands, introduce yourself, gain consent, find a chaperone and expose appropriately. In this case, you will need to have a look at the abdomen and the trousers, shoes and socks will need to come off. So what might we find? Well, the first thing to note is whether or not your patient is having pain at rest. Johnny, our cartoon patient here, is well quite comfortable, clearly. Although I'd hope he wouldn't be so relaxed walking into clinic smoking a cigarette. Unfortunately, he does indeed smoke like a chimney, and now here he is with his gammy legs. First thing we need to do is inspect. Are there any scars from a previous bypass? Really ischemic feet might be very pale. But if they're really bad and the patient is sitting or the legs are dangling off the end of the bed, then they might actually look quite red or even a purple colour. We'll come back to that. Anyway, have a look for any tissue loss. In critically ischemic legs, you might see punched out ulcers in pressure areas and extremities, so the heels, tips of the toes, and around the nail beds. You may even find gangrene. 
Next, palpate. Legs with a poor blood supply might feel cool. Compare right to left. After checking for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, check all the pulses and have a listen for any breweries over the adductor canal. Finally, consider your special tests, Berger's test. Now, if this is positive, it indicates severe ischemia. And this is how you do it. With a patient supine, raise the legs. I wouldn't worry too much about Berger's angle. Just make sure you note whether or not a foot goes pale. And if it does, gently lower that foot down to the side of the bed and you might see it become quite red again. This is a positive Berger's test. And it may already have been suggested as those reddish feet turned pale when the patient got both feet up onto the bed at the start of the examination. Next, take a handheld Doppler, check the ABPI and make a note of the Doppler waveforms. The ankle brachial pressure index is a ratio of the blood pressure at the ankle compared to the blood pressure in the arm. You need a handheld Doppler and a blood pressure cuff and you record the blood pressure at each dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial artery, taking the higher of the two for each ankle and dividing it by the pressure in either arm. So an ABPI of 1 generally means that arterial flow to the foot is unobstructed and so the pressure here is equal to the pressure at the arm. Anything less than 0.9 represents lower limb arterial disease. Once it gets below 0.8 it is moderate and less than 0.5 is severe. And then ischemia can become critical. Now when it comes to critical ischemia there is more than one definition but my preferred one is not based on an ABPI measurement but is defined as ischemia characterized by rest pain and or tissue loss. But what if the ABPI is elevated? This may happen, for example, where vessels calcify and stiffen in diabetic patients, meaning that the blood pressure cuff needs to be filled to a higher pressure to overcome this extra resistance, leading to a falsely elevated ABPI. This phenomenon can be strongly suspected in an ABPI above 1.3. We can use the ABPI to help us diagnose peripheral arterial disease, to provide serial objective measures of response to treatment or monitoring of disease progression, and a reduced ABPI also tells us that a patient may be at risk from cardiovascular events, even if there is no claudication. If I asked you, what is the characteristic Doppler waveform in a normal artery, what would you say? The answer is triphasic. So let's take a look at what this means. The whooshes you get from a Doppler probe are generated by blood flow underneath the probe. The first whoosh is due to ventricular systole propagating blood through the vessel. In normal healthy arteries, there's actually a transient reversal of flow during early diastole, giving the second phase of the waveform. And then blood is carried a bit further in diastole, giving the last sound. Here is what a triphasic signal sounds like. In reality, a biphasic signal may be adequate when you are listening with a handheld Doppler, but a monophasic signal, so a single whoosh, is a sign of disease. Obviously, having no signal at all is even worse. The most basic investigations to do are blood tests. Have a look at the full blood count and renal function. We want to know what the renal function is like since we may be thinking of giving iodinated contrast and pre-existing renal impairment is a major risk factor for contrast-induced nephrotoxicity. Check the lipid profile and you could test for diabetes by performing a fasting glucose. When it comes to imaging, you need to have a look at the arterial tree and see where the stenoses or occlusions are in the pelvis and lower limb. An angiogram is the gold standard, but this is an invasive procedure involving a stab in the groin and giving contrast with the risk of allergic reaction and, again, nephrotoxicity. So we only really do this when we are considering a simultaneous therapeutic intervention such as angioplasty, which we'll talk more about later. Well, what else can we do to image the vessels? There are three other tests. Ultrasound duplex, so an ultrasound probe looking at flow and vessel calibre. CT angiography, and this involves contrast, and so may pose a risk again. But CT is not invasive like traditional angiography. And then there is MR angiography. Great, but time-consuming and contraindicated in some patients for various metallic reasons. 
Now, I don't think you need to know the ins and outs of these investigations. Just know that these are your options and they're all generally good at doing the job, although they each have their pros and cons. How do you manage these patients? Think logically. Management can be divided into conservative, medical, interventional and surgical. Conservative management is about lifestyle and risk factor modification. The most important thing a patient can do to help themselves is to stop smoking. It is important to be honest with patients and tell them that if they continue to smoke, they might lose their legs and that really isn't an exaggeration. Not only that, it is unlikely that any revascularization procedure would be offered to anyone who hasn't stopped smoking because there may not be much to be gained. Claudicating patients should be encouraged to walk beyond the pain a little more each time to build up the collateral circulation. Many patients can see an improvement in their claudication distance from this. In some places, there are specific exercise classes that you can refer patients to as it has been shown that supervised exercise therapy is more effective than unsupervised exercise therapy. With medical management, we are continuing to modify some risk factors and we're also throwing some drugs into the mix. Patients should make sure their blood glucose measurements are in check or get tested if they're not known to be diabetic. That may be done as part of the investigations. And patients' blood pressures should also be regularly monitored and antihypertensives should be titrated accordingly. Patients should be on an antiplatelet agent, so that's aspirin or clopidogrel, and also a statin. Patients with rest pain or tissue loss may be offered angioplasty. This means feeding a guide wire past an artificial stenosis via a puncture in the groin and then expanding a balloon to open up the vessel, often leaving a stent in place. However, this is not without risk. It may trigger thrombosis or emboli, and so there is a small but real risk of losing the limb altogether. Other complications include those of the arterial puncture itself, such as bleeding or pseudoaneurysm formation, in addition to the stenosis recurring in the future. Surgical bypasses are reserved for critically ischemic limbs where angioplasty is not possible. They are big operations with serious risk. Many patients with peripheral arterial disease will have other significant comorbidities such as coronary artery disease and so the risk of mortality associated with major surgery can be high. Grafts can be natural, for example a reversed saphenous vein graft, and grafts can be synthetic such as PTFE or Dacron. They all have their pros and cons but suffice to say that important risks include graft thrombosis and graft infection. Graft thrombosis may present as an acutely ischemic limb a synthetic graft infection can also be a disaster. And once this happens, patients may be on long-term antibiotics to prevent generalized sepsis, and the only way to cure the infection may be to remove the graft with possible disastrous consequences for the limb. Now let's take a tour of some of the bypass grafts you need to know about. Bypass grafts need adequate inflow and good runoff. And runoff means that when blood arrives at the end of the graft, there are patent vessels that can take the blood to the tissues. Here's our diagram of our lower limb arterial tree, but this time we've also added in the axillary artery. So now let's have a look at some bypass grafts, and we'll start with the FEMPOP bypass, which is short for femoral popliteal, and there's no prizes for guessing what that does. Now this is a bypass that runs from the femoral artery to the popliteal artery, which would bypass an occlusion in the SFA. What about a femoral femoral crossover graft? This may be plumbed to bypass an occluded common or external iliac artery on one side, meaning that both limbs receive a blood supply from one healthy external iliac and CFA. An aortofemoral graft plumbs the abdominal aorta into common femoral artery, bypassing critical disease of the aortic bifurcation and iliacs. An aortobifemoral is a graft running from the aorta to both common femorals. An axillofemoral graft is one that is plumbed from one axillary artery down to the CF8, which is used when an aortofemoral graft is too big an operation. When a femoral femoral graft is used with an axillofemoral, this is called an axillobifem. This means an axillary artery is supplying both legs. Now in the axillofemoral, the femfem crossover and the fempot bypasses, you should be able to fill the graft under the skin. These are so-called extra-anatomic and can be performed when an abdominal approach is too risky for the patient. 
When examining a patient with an extra anatomic bypass graft, you should try to feel a pulse over the graft in addition to evaluating the state of the limb it is supplying. Regarding the affected leg in someone with a lower limb arterial disease, around 2-12% to of patients may end up requiring amputation at 10 years. The most important thing a patient can do to avoid progression of their arterial disease is stopping smoking. Owing to the state of arteries elsewhere in the body, such as the coronaries and the effects of their risk factors having on the rest of their body, such as the smoking and diabetes, only two thirds of patients with peripheral arterial disease may be alive after five years, and around one third at 15 years. So when you see these patients, pay close attention to their risk factors as they need to be controlled very well indeed. In summary, peripheral arterial disease commonly affects older men and in those who smoke, are diabetic, hypertensive, have raised cholesterol, pre-existing atherosclerotic disease and a family history. They may complain of claudication, which is pain in a muscle group brought on by exercise and relieved by rest. Examination should focus on the presence of pulses, evidence of tissue loss, which would indicate critical ischemia, and the ABPI and Doppler waveforms. Image the arterial tree with duplex ultrasound, CT or MR angiography. Manage these patients by managing their risk factors and most importantly encouraging them to quit smoking. Medically patients should ordinarily be started on an antiplatelet agent and a statin. Interventionally angioplasty may be offered when ischemia is critical and bypass surgery may be a last resort. So that's peripheral arterial disease and I'm Danny. Please leave some comments and feedback and view some more tutorials at boxmedicine.com. Thanks very much. Bye bye.